Welcome back to Sex and Space, where we explore sex across all of its infinite dimensions. Today, we've got a great conversation to share with you that I had with the wonderful Ariel Zadok. Ariel is a film and TV intimacy coordinator, sexologist, and the founder of The Sexy Directory. But just before we dive in, we need your support. Talking and learning about sex is crucial, but it often leads us to being silenced on social media. This makes it harder for others to find us and suggests that sex isn't okay to discuss, but it absolutely is. More knowledge means better outcomes for everyone. You can help support us by following the podcast, connecting with us on our socials, and keeping the conversation going via sexandspace.com. Now, let's drop into my interview with Ariel Zadok, a certified intimacy coordinator for film and TV, sexologist, and the founder of The Sexy Directory, an upcoming sex education platform launching in 2025. With nearly two decades of experience in advertising, film, and television, Ariel focuses on communication, consent, and education in her work facilitating intimacy, both on screen and in real life. She is also the leader of the Coven of Harlots, a transformative program for women exploring their sexuality, and serves as a consent coordinator for the Play LA, as well as a resident facilitator at The Lovely Fate. You can catch her show, Birds and Bees Don't Fuck, on YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm excited to share this one with you. Let's get into it. Welcome to Sex and Space. Thank you very much for um, sparing your uh, precious time. Thank you for having me. I love the name of this show, Sex in Space. We want <laughs> sex everywhere, but especially in space. That's that's the next frontier, which, it, it, listen, they're definitely <laughs> fucking up there, let's be honest. Can I curse on this show? I'm sorry. I just Oh, please, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll... my show literally has fucking the title, so. <laughs> I know, I know. Don't worry. We'll, uh... we'll put trigger warnings everywhere for those yeah. that care but no it's absolutely fine um yeah sex and space i mean the idea is that you know we're creating space to talk about sex blah 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 um but you know i love that i love the birds and bees don't fuck as well because um i mean it's so true but when you unpack that thing that, you, that you've talked about where it's just like oh my god we we got fucked our education got fucked yeah <laughs> Every single one of us, and it's across every country, across every religion. It's, there, there are so few people who have had accurate, affirming sex education. Yeah. No matter what your background is, which is like, that is the unifier for all of us. None of us were ever taught this. Yeah. So it's okay to go and learn. Go read books. Go take classes join join groups like we need to teach ourselves we need to make up for a lot of lost time literally lifetime after lifetime of lost time and guilt and shame and judgment and misinformation and all all the things and all the layers so absolutely oh it's it's intergenerational actually when you talk about lifetimes it's Mm -hmm. it's like it's been passed on some of this some of this crap Oh yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean our shame is passed on, our judgments passed on, the misinformation is passed on. I mean, it is very generational, not even just from the systemic issues around sex education, but the belief systems within our own homes around sexuality and sex and pleasure and education and all of those things. Yeah, I know. Wow. So well we could we could <laughs> <laughs> go down that swirling vortex rabbit hole um but i would love to actually i guess let's let's start with your own sex education um what what sort of and a bit of a, a chronological um trajectory into into what you is to what you do sort of how how did you what inspired you to get in get into the work that you do I always joke it's a lot of bad sex, which is true. It is true. Uh, I have had way more terrible sex than I've had good or even great sex. So really that that's it. But way, way, way before I started having sex, um, I was just a wee girl uh, listening under the blankets. I think I was like eight years old or something. And I just remember listening to Dr. Ruth and then uh, it changed into... um, Doc, uh, uh, Dr. Drew, he took over the show. So I just remember being really, really little, far too little to be listening to any of this stuff. And I would have my little radio on, I'd be in the dark, I'd be under the covers, I'd have it on really, really, really low <laughs> because I didn't want to get caught. But yeah. I was so fascinated 
by all of the questions that came in and all of the different ways that people were engaging in this. And, you know, I knew what sex was because I had TV and, you know, yeah. kids, kids are way smarter than we give them credit for. They know way more than any adults ever give them credit for. So I knew what sex was and, you know, and I knew all these things and I just found it fascinating. And then there was another show uh, called Real Sex on HBO, and that was another case. I did we did have HBO in my family. I was very privileged to have that. That was like our one nice thing. Um, and so I had a TV in my bedroom. Also, again, coming from a place of privilege, but I would have that on super duper low. Like I almost couldn't even hear it because like yeah, pressed up. <laughs> yeah, like my, I shared a wall, a bedroom wall with my parents. This would be like early, so they'd probably be off in the kitchen or whatever. But like my dad has the best hearing. He would hear everything i'd be whispering he's like can you keep it down i'm like what anyway so again like watching these programs and um just being completely fascinated i remember that there was one episode and maybe this is my my memory being jumbled because we know how memory works yeah um but i do remember these people um they must have been at a play party which is a sex party we call it a play party because sex is not always what happens or required um so they were at some sort of like a, a workshop or a play party or something like that and they were just like these yellow and orange and red tents and it was they were doing tantra and it was just like i was in yeah so i think i've just always been really fascinated by sex and sexuality. I can also remember watching movies and uh, watching how people kissed. And it's funny because when we are kissing on screen, we don't use tongue, not unless it's actually required. And so when I was little, I would see that and I literally thought this is going to be one for viewers, not listeners. So I, yeah. I think we're doing video on this too. Um, yeah. But I would think that kissing was just two mouths coming together like om, om, yeah. om, which it kind of is, right? Yeah. Like I would just have this picture. And even now when I'm intimacy coordinating and I'm talking about like the, the pacing of kisses, I'll still sometimes do that with my hands just to kind of give an example of something. Um, Cause that kind of, that kind of is what kissing on screen is and kissing without tongue is, it really is just your mouths opening and closing mm. together at different distances and paces. And so I guess I was kind of, uh, uh, deconstructing sex scenes <laughs> from a really early age. Uh, and I was just always fascinated with learning. So for me, it just started really early with media and yeah. probably why I love media so much. It's got a lot of terrible things, but a lot of wonderful things. And it was just kind of a, a lifelong curiosity that continues on to this day. I love learning about sex. I love hearing about people's sex. I love learning new techniques and being in classes and forever a student. I hated school, but I love learning about sex. Yeah. Well, that's it. Like the education doesn't have to stop. We always mm -hmm. ask, you know, what's, what was your formal sex education like? And, um, of course, most people are just still on that journey. Right. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. That's really cool. So, I mean, I had this, I had this idea that, um, you were watching, um, you know, a movie and there was like a terrible sex scene and you were just like, I've got to do something about this. <laughs> 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 maybe like that's how the um the kind of intimacy coordinator for um you know for films and tv and advertising sort of sort of kicked off i just i love that idea but um how how did you get in get into that it's actually way juicier than that so yeah. um i came up in production as a producer and an assistant director and early in my career i was living in new zealand so i was yeah. with you um and I was working on a show. I'm not going to name the show, but let's just say that there were a lot of dirty, naked, bloody bodies all the time. And yep. there was a lot of sex in this show. And they, uh, I was the, the assistant director who was looking after all of the background. And so I come into work one day and they were like, okay, so we're shooting in a brothel and you need to set the background having an orgy. Here are the 25 people that you need mm -hmm. to set or whatever those numbers were. Um, this was in 2012. Intimacy yeah. coordinating was completely unheard of. We did not have protocols. We did not have any sort of way of doing things. We did have nudity writers, um, but they, especially when it came, came to background, that really came in the form of you were getting paid differently to do different things. So some people 
were getting paid to be topless. Some people were being paid to simulate sex acts. Some people were being paid to just be there. So everyone was there on a different level. Yeah. And so I had about um, probably maybe two hours at the top of the day. I think that's being super generous because it was uh, everything is already set. We, we don't have to like come into a new location and set everything up. So probably less than two hours. I don't know what the timeline was um, to figure all of this out. And so I just intrinsically knew I need to come up with protocols. I need to come up with all these acts and I need to make sure that everyone is consenting to what they are doing. So I separated by genders. Yes, that's very binary, but at the time that's the, those were the tools that we had yeah. or that I had. And so, um, I had all of the men in one area. I had all the women in another area. And so I, I sat down with myself and I thought of every single sect, sex act I could possibly want to dress in that area. And that ranged from just being there, having a conversation, maybe topless or nude to full on simulation of penetration. So mm. really ranging. And so I had this massive list of sex acts and I went to each group. I also had the uh, background people with me and they had all their nudity writers, which again was just like, they can do this because they're getting paid for this. They can't do this because they're not getting paid for this. So very, very different from how it works today. Um, but I pretty much just went down that list and I said, raise your hand if you feel comfortable doing this on screen today. And then the next layer of this is going to be whether you want to do that with somebody of the same sex or a different sex. So same gender, mm -hmm. different gender. Um, and I just kind of went through that list and I figured out my pairings. It was just like a massive, massive puzzle. Um, if there's anything in AD loves, it's a puzzle. Give me those puzzles. <laughs> I want to make sense of everything. Uh, that's also why I love this job too. It's like, it's the bringing together. It's a gathering of information and making it all make sense and, and getting it back out into the world. Uh, where it needs to be. And so, yeah, that was, that was kind of the first, um, my first toe in anything like this. And I loved it. And being in New Zealand, even working on commercials, there was more nudity. I did simulated sex in commercials. I did nudity in commercials. Yeah. It's just a different place than the US. And so, um, yeah, I just, I came up with protocols and I did the best I could to do that. And then over the years, um, you know, starting with probably Alicia Rodas on HBO, I think she was probably the first one to be on, on a big stage and really get integrated into the film and television world because theater had been doing it for a little bit longer than we were. And so, um, you know, I watched her and then all of these different programs came up and this, that, and the other thing, it took me a while to really fully step into it because it's really difficult mm. when you already have work and you're already freelancing and you're doing well as, you know, producer and an AD and whatever, um, you know, it's a little bit difficult to take that risk to turn down stuff that was paying my bills to literally beg someone to hire me to do this job that wasn't a job. And, you know, it was, it was a really, um, it's, it was an interesting path, but now I'm in a place where I'm, I'm just intimacy coordinating. I'll AD every now and then I, I got a call for a job this morning. Yeah. So I'm still doing a little bit of that, but, um, yeah, it was just, um, I don't know, one, that's, one at a time. That's so cool though, because I mean, I guess, like you said, it, the world's changed a lot since since then, but but if this role has um, you know also also kind of evolved, I'd be interested in like that trajectory as well because it, I mean, there's obviously there is the there's the coordinating with um, you know actors and directors and trying to um, you know obviously pr produce a vision with with people and consenting adults and and all that kind of stuff. But um, in terms of some of the work that you that you do now, which is more about accuracy and accurate representation, and um, like how much has that now sort of come come to the fore? Like, do you do you try through your work to, you know, um, for people to to sort of show a more realistic view of sex, or is it is it? is it down to the kind of what the director is wanting or that, that kind of stuff? Like how does, yeah, it really depends on the group that you're working with and the team mm -hmm. that you're working with. Are they open to the feedback that, Hey, we're not really portraying this in an accurate way. And we're always going to yeah. offer up that feedback, but it, that's not 
up to us whether or not they decide to change those things. Obviously, if an actor doesn't want to do something, that's completely off the table, no questions asked. Yeah. Um, but when it comes into the nuances of, of accuracy in storytelling, yes, we are always, always, always going to be trying to move that needle forward, mm. but we don't have control. We yeah, are no, not the directors. Yeah. I think a lot of people misunderstand that though. I think a lot of people think that, you know, this job is coming in and we're going to tell everybody what to do and we're going to overstep the director and not saying that some unqualified or untrained people in the early days um, that were maybe on a little bit of a power trip doing that. And, and listen, it's a, it's a new role. Not everybody comes from production. Not everybody understands the nuances of those things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was leading a, a studio over the pandemic for health and safety, um, running the entire program with a very small team of a, a very small leadership team. It was myself and a few other people. Um, and so I had firsthand experience with some of the things that can come up when you, when you put somebody in this type of a high level position that mm. maybe came from a different background. So I think that there's just a lot of, um, understanding on all parties in terms of where those boundaries lie. But the best case scenario is that you are working with a collaborative team that wants to do good, that wants yeah. to show accurate sexual experiences, because at the end of the day, that's, what's going to move your audience. If you Absolutely. want your audience to walk away with bated breath and sweating and being in that moment with your, with your story, you have to make it accurate because you're going to lose people. So, I've been very fortunate. I would say everyone that I work with is like so on board with the things that I say, with the suggestions that I make, um, with the red flags that I raise. I've been very fortunate to work with wonderful people, but you also hear a lot of horror stories of people who are just like, nope, this is, this is what it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, we as, as intimacy coordinators definitely have a responsibility to try and shift the culture and shift how media is portraying everything from body image to sexual experiences to, um, you know, familial intimacy and things of that nature. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really layered. It's really layered. And ultimately this is a collaborative position and a collaborative field. So it really does take everyone being on board with, we want to do better and we have to do better, not just for the actors, but for the audience and the story that we're telling. Yeah. And no, I think that's, it's so interesting just to sort of think about, you know, um, sex scenes in in let's just say movies um mm -hmm. you know and how how it's sort of there is a there's a trajectory and you know i says the cliche you know it's probably um from say the first top gun movie or something like that you know <laughs> curtains blowing in the wind and people kind of collapsing in some sort of romantic clinch and stuff like that to to i mean can you can you tell when you watch when you watch movies and and tv and stuff now can do you think you can spot one that's done well versus one that that hasn't? Oh yeah, I mean, you, yeah. yeah, you can definitely see a good scene from a bad scene, just yeah. like any other scene, just like a stunt scene, just like a, a fight scene, like where you're emotionally fighting. Um, you, you know, there's there's good content and there's bad content, so you can definitely yeah. see those things. Um, I think when it comes to intimacy, it's also a little bit different because you're, you know, not every actor is great at selling intimacy when they don't like their scene partner. And that is part of the work that we do is yeah. to help people in those situations. Like you can't choose your coworkers. At the end of the day, we're all just coworkers. We're all just doing a job. It's just that their job is putting their body in a situation that is normally reserved for people who are who they are attracted to, who they want to be having a sexual experience with. We're asking our bodies to do something that is very specifically held in a, in a container. And mm -hmm. now we're asking them to do that with their coworker. And if you don't like your coworker or, or sometimes also, you know, if you just had some really difficult content with that actor, because maybe these two characters hated each other and now we're shooting a scene where they absolutely love each other. Yeah. So there can be a lot of different challenges and with the right support, you can help people get to that place where we are really selling it, where we are fully engaged, where our, it's a full body yes in terms of I am in this scene, I'm, I'm true to this character, I'm true to this moment in the story. Um, but when you don't have that support, 
sometimes yeah. you can see through that, you know? Yeah. No, I, I think I, most of the time, I don't know if, if, if it's a subtlety that, that you pick up on, but I, yeah, I guess it must be easier for you to, to, to spot a bad one from a, <laughs> from a good one. It's so interesting though, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of the accuracy thing. And I think that's, that's interesting that, you know, maybe working with different communities. I don't know. Like, do you work with say LGBTQ plus communities, trans, that, that kind of storytelling side of things as well? Or have you done any, any work with, um, like kink coordinating or in any of, any of the sort of niches, I suppose as well. So on screen, no, in real life as a sexologist. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I haven't had too many scripts yet where, uh, I've been working on that stuff, which is interesting because I do work on that stuff outside. Yeah. Um, so outside world, yes, very experienced. Um, and with lots of different things also have the right people to call in for the right things. So yeah. depending on what the story and what the context and what is actually going on, I may lean on one of my fellow educators who does specialize in, in whatever it is that we're working on as a consultant to make sure that I am doing right. Because even though it is a world that I work in and that I engage in personally, and that, that is a part of my life, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that I wouldn't want to spot check with any of that stuff because I have access to it. Yeah, um, yeah. and realistically, Anybody should be doing that. I am trained in kink, in BDSM, in Tantra, in disabilities, in aging, in all of these things. Because I'm a sex educator, I've also had training as an IC as well. But very much I believe in if you know someone who ab like that is their life day in and day out and they absolutely specialize in that thing, yeah. then hire them separately. The production, the production, sure, they should probably hire them. But you as a professional... Like me as a professional, I just want to spot check with one of my friends, like with one of my professional friends that is a professional dominatrix or teaches. Yeah. I have a, a great friend um, who teach, all she does is teach kink classes. That's it on every topic you can imagine as long, you know, pertaining to kink. And I have several friends like that. So, you know, that's something that um, you want to lean on all of your resources, even if you're mm. the one doing the job. Um, as far as accuracy is concerned, especially if it's not a world that you are in, like the education is one piece of it. You can be trained in something, but it is so important that you are actually going to people within that community to make sure like a, a leader in that community, not just like, Hey, I've got a kinky friend. Let me ask my kinky friend. No, yeah. I'm talking about a professional, um, especially when it comes to anything that is under the beautiful LGBTQIA plus rainbow you don't want to go to your gay friend or your trans friend or your uh, pan friend or your asexual friend and be like, Hey, is this how it works? That is inappropriate. Please don't do that. Yeah. Uh, go to a professional, go to a sex educator that specializes in that area. Yeah. It's so interesting though. I think that the, um, because it's, because what you're sort of talking about here ends up in, ends up in culture, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're talking about, movie scenes i mean one that sort of popped into my head was maybe brokeback mountain right mm -hmm. um you know great great movie but because it because it entered you know the mainstream um you know that that's where that's where sort of certain things yeah like accuracy of either storytelling or, or you know those those sorts of th factors um I think interesting to do really well. And that, that sounds like exactly it's the sort of the sort of work that you're doing is to, is to try and be as authentic as possible because, you know, it's a runaway train of misinformation. Otherwise mm -hmm. that's. Yeah. That's and not only that, and by the way, 50 shades of gray is a perfect example of that. That whole movie is completely problematic. It's abusive. That is not how BDSM works. That is not how a Dom sub relationship works. So like mm. red flag, red flag, red flag, got to say that out loud. Cause that's yeah. just, you know, people really clung on to that. And that was written by someone who was not engaging in kink, who does not understand that world. Um, and yes, it's a fantasy, but that told a lot of people's stories about what it's like to be in a kinky relationship or in a dominant sub 
uh, relationship or anything like that. And it's very mm -hmm. problematic because that was completely abusive. So, you know, that that's a great example of, yeah. of what we do. And what we see in the media tells us what to believe. It tells us how to feel. It shows us examples of ourselves or our fantasies and how people react to that also matters. So when we see something like Brokeback Mountain and we see so many people being so freaked out by cowboys fucking, oh my God, there are men who like men who also are cowboys who are masculine. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Like, no, that's just a part of being a human being. There are yeah. so many masked gay men and they're wonderful and beautiful. There are so many gay cowboys. Like, this is just life. There, there are people everywhere that are into everything. So, um, you know, we do have a responsibility as anyone in the media, not just intimacy coordinators, but anybody who is creating media, we have a responsibility to the overall culture because our culture comes from media. So if we are putting out inaccurate messages like, everybody comes from penetration or yeah. sex last, <laughs> you know, you're making out and then you're fucking like, granted, I know we only have so much time to, to shoot a scene. And sometimes we kind of have to do that. But within that, we can do different things, at least for the kissing part to mm -hmm. show a little bit more accuracy. Cause again, intimacy coordinators can't change everything, but we can impact things. So we all collectively have a responsibility to make sure that we are putting out messages, that we are showing pleasure for people with vulvas, that we are showing the expansiveness of queer relationships, that we are showing that asexual relationships exist, that we are showing healthy kinky relationships. Mm. That is all of our responsibilities as anybody working in the media, whether you are doing that as scripted or non-scripted. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I, I kind of understand that the 50 shades of gray thing, you know, again, it kind of became a bit of a runaway train, you know, yeah. it was oh, a yeah. fantasy self publish all of a sudden, you know, off, off it goes to the races. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but to a degree, it yeah. also showed what people were craving more and they want to play in kink. They mm. want to explore the different sensations that exist within our body and within our realm. They want to explore what dominance could be. But the problem is that we were showing them what it is in, a, in an unhealthy way that will lead to people and I guarantee has led people to being in abusive relationships, abusive mm -hmm. top, bottom, dom, sub style relationships, or just engaging in kink in an unsafe way. One of the core principles of kink is to practice it safely and not mm. everyone has good protocols. And let me tell you, there are so many people, men, I'm going to say who are like, I'm a dom and they're not because they don't have any protocols. They don't know the safety conversations. They don't go through all of the discussions that are required before they're not educating themselves on how these things work. And even if you're the sub, you need to educate yourself on this stuff too. So, you know, it opened up a whole conversation, which is great. And I love that, but because it was done in an unsafe way and it showed us depictions of things that people really do want, they want kinky sex. They yeah. want to experience all of the things that this can unlock for them psychologically, emotionally, physically, personally, there are a lot of benefits to kink play and exploration boundaries, all of these things, but we were showing it to them in an unsafe way, which then tells them, well, this is how you do it. And that can get you into very unsafe situations that does do harm. So we have to always make sure that we are not doing harm and yeah. accuracy helps us do that. Yeah, no, I thought they really missed a trick really. I mean, having since talked to, um, talk to sex workers who, who deal, deal with, you know, kink and all, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm communication and consent are like the the yeah. two massive things i mean what an amazing takeaway for like just the rest of your life as well yeah <laughs> um and not coerced yeah. consent by the way because what they yeah. were showing in that movie was coercion that was not right. consent that yeah. was all coercion it was all forced it was all coercive there was no that was not a negotiation he literally just gave her a piece of paper and was like sign off on this you're signing everything away i control you now that is not how it works <laughs> 
<laughs> the dominant is there yeah. to create experiences for the sub. It is a co-creation. We are talking about our desires. We're talking about what do you want to try? We're, we're working through what level do you want to feel? Okay, I'm going to start at a two. I'm going to start at a one. Do you want me to go harder? Do you want me to go softer? It's conversations. It's ongoing consent. It's check-ins. It's aftercare. It's all these things that make it safe mm. because the safety is the foundation for all of this stuff. Onset in real life, Safety is the foundation because when we feel safe, we can be expansive. So uh, let's expand on that one then. So talking about problematic misinformation in the mainstream, is there intimacy? Does, does, the, does the intimacy coordinator role exist for pornography? Yes. It yeah. does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like in terms of, you know, some of the sort of narratives that have, um, you know, probably been brought forward in culture and, and, you know, now, now seem kind of more mainstream, um, that you see in porn a lot. Is, is there any of this sort of same, same work being bought, bought into the porn industry? Like so um, I, trying to show more realism or? Yeah, so I don't work in adults, so I can't speak to it necessarily on that level. And I want to be uh, very yep. transparent about where I where I am. Um, but I will say that um, Erica Lust, I don't know what year she really started, but she kind of started um, feminist porn and yep. ethical porn. And so we are moving in a space where we are seeing more self-created porn. Make Love Not Porn is a great resource for that. Sorry, That's, yeah, uh, good. yeah, Cindy Darnell. Uh, no, sorry, is that her name? Cindy Gallup. Know. Gallup, Gallup, Gallup. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I mix names sometimes. Um, but so, um, yeah, so Make Love Not Porn, um, great resource. That's all self-made pornography, self kind of um, similar to, to OnlyFans in that it's, it's creators doing it for themselves. Um, you've got companies like Erica Lust, um, you've got other companies. And so what we are seeing and what we have been seeing for like the last decade or maybe 15 years, I don't know. I feel like time just flies. So maybe longer <laughs> than that, um, that is the emergence of feminist and ethical porn. And what that means is that we are looking to have more, more storytelling and pleasure that is focused on people who have vulvas. Mm. And sometimes that does, some people are into degradation. So I don't want to say that um, bondage, degradation, um, various sex acts that people aren't into because people with vulvas and people who identify as women are into those things as well. Absolutely. We don't want to shame that. That is totally valid. If that is what you're into, let's go do yeah. it. Love it for you. But what we are seeing in ethical and feminist porn is that there is more accuracy in the storytelling, that it is done in a way where all performers are fully consenting. Oftentimes they are getting to choose who they work with. So unlike in uh, mainstream media where you don't get to choose your scene partner, in pornography, you do. You get to, you get to choose your scene partner. You get to choose your boundaries. Um, I, I met a, a director producer last year at um, the X3 Awards or, or yeah, I think it was the X3 Awards. Anyway, it was, it was some, uh, it was the adult X biz awards. That's what it is. Yeah. It was the X biz awards. Um, and I met this director and producer and, and he was talking to me about intimacy coordinating and he had a situation where, um, there was one actor, um, there was one man and three women and they were going to do a scene and they have their protocol is that test results are always in before you roll cameras. So, um, they're, they're constantly testing as they should yeah. be, as all of us should be. And so he had a test result that was from, I think 48 hours prior, something like that, 48 or, or 72 or something like that, but it was not the latest test result. And that was a boundary for all three women. That was, that was just their boundary. They had their tests in and it was time to shoot and his test results weren't in. So they shut the shoot down and they postponed it for another day. And mm. that's what we're talking about when we're talking about intimacy coordinating in pornography and just creating ethical porn and, yeah. and, and producing this type of content, which has a right to exist. Porn is great. It is such a great tool when we are doing it with care and intention and consent and authenticity. Mm.
Yeah, no, I think that's true. I mean, I think it's a New Zealand Australia um, statistic, but it, it it probably plays out the rest of the world too. But like, apparently, kids see it at about twelve years old. Yeah, um, you know, and it becomes default sex ed, right? So mm-hmm. it's like, oh, that's what I'm going to be doing. Yeah, or um, you know, that's the noises I'm going to make, or how mm-hmm. I'm going to act, or. Start I have that sucking. conversation all the time. It's not yeah. It's not just there. I mean, that's here as well. Most yeah. people, specifically those who identify as men, they learned everything from porn. And Absolutely. and women, people who identify as women, um, they see how they're supposed to react to porn. And they see, oh, penetration. I'm supposed to go crazy for penetration. And, and now we're not advocating for what actually feels good. And for most people with vulvas penetration ain't it certainly not by itself and so we are learning so much misinformation and again like i don't want to say that there are not sex acts that are happening in pornography that people with all body parts really love and enjoy i think again like degradation is a good example of that but it's how we are doing that that matters it's how the performers are treated on set that matters. Yeah. It's what the content is because for some people and degradation is just kind of an easy one because I think people can understand being spoken down to and, and yeah. being called like a little slut or whatever. For some people, I know many people that are like, Oh, I fucking love, love that. I love yeah. it, but it has to be done ethically and consensually. And by the way, saying ethical is, is a slippery slope because ethics means something different to everybody. So mm. it's that confident. Yes. It's that consenting yeah. informed, confident. Yes. Um, there's a place for all of this, but how mm. we do it is what matters. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that the fact that it, uh, you know, becomes that, that default education when we don't mm-hmm. have the kind of conversations like we're having now to mm-hmm. educate people on, oh, hey, you know, this is performative for want of a better word, yeah. or this is uh, meant to, you know, be erotic, but not to educate as such. So, um, Absolutely. you know, it's, it's not a good tool. It's yeah. not mm-hmm. a good tool. And then there's a lot of unlearning that has to do. And then there's a lot of labor that people who identify as women go through and people who have vulvas go through because they are often doing the work. Mm. People who are, are um, LGBTQIA+, plus, people who have vulvas, people who are non-binary, which, you know, LGBTQIA+, plus covers everybody, yeah. but it's worth saying out loud. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, we are the ones who are educating ourselves because we have felt like we're broken, we've had bad sex, we don't understand what's wrong with us, and we just wanna know more. We know mm. that there is something that we can learn more about, so we are educating ourselves. And then you have most men that I speak to specifically about sex education and where did you learn things? Their answer is almost always, oh, I slept with an older woman. Oh, this one woman. So we are putting the labor of pleasure completely on women in cis straight dynamics. Yeah. That is a problem. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't see a problem in relying on the woman that you're sleeping with to teach you what works, I don't know how to help you because that is a problem. Like that's that we need to start there. You cannot learn everything you need to know about sex from your one partner. You can learn about their specifics. You can learn about nuances of their body, but you got to come to the table with information. And that's where the sexy directory comes in. That's where conversations like this come in. That's where all of these other tools and resources, there are so many great books read come as you are. Everybody needs to read that book always going to plug that book. That's like the first thing I tell everybody to do. Um, But we have this cultural issue where the labor of pleasure is on women. And it's a mixture of everything being learned from porn, of not normalizing sex education and shame and ego. Mm. But if we can break past that stuff, then, then, you know, then we're not putting the labor of pleasure on women. Absolutely. But pleasure is one of those ones where I don't think it features in, in sex ed at no. all so that mm-hmm. that's you know like i think you've got somewhere on your website about about sex ed or maybe on your podcast where it's like you know that one video that everyone remembers or yep. the one talk about you know the banana and the condom and you know all that just crap but pleasures 
because it's like, oh, what are you going to talk to me about the clitoris or yeah. orgasms? I mean, it's, or, you know, and this is the basics, but it's yeah. completely left out. But then, of course, you're right. It, it dovetails so nicely into shame and all of the other mm -hmm. stuff, which we've been uh, learning since we were about two years old to not touch your bits and pieces. You know, oh, yeah. don't do that. It's dirty or doesn't, you know, if it feels good, you've got to. So, yeah. We've well, especially unpack, for people right. socialized as women. Like, yeah. if you were socialized as a girl growing up, then masturbation was off the table for you. It was disgusting. And if you were socialized as a boy, then you should be masturbating all the time. Yeah. Both of these are very <laughs> problematic messages, right? Like, yeah. not all people with penises were jerking off all the time. A lot of them were. Most of them, yeah. maybe. But not everybody. And so you were made to feel like you were the weirdo if you weren't. On the other side of that... If your body part was a vulva and you were raised as a girl, you were socialized as a girl, even if you were intersex and you had all sorts of different body parts and different configurations of body parts, but however you were socialized, you would have been put into one of those categories as well because we're very binary. And within that binary, masturbation is bad for people who are socialized this way. And it's expected for those Normalized, who are socialized yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and even within that, I mean, I can go into so many layers of that, but when we then couple this, the, the masturbation practices with pornography and what we're seeing, we have a whole group of people who were socialized as boys who have penises, who are also engaging in sex as a fast, quick, adrenaline rushed activity. Right. which is not how bodies work if you have a vulva. Mm. Arguably not if you have a penis either, but they, they react in different ways. They have different systems. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a whole group of people who their pleasure and their body reacts to that quick adrenaline rush jackhammer because yeah. they didn't want to get caught. They had to do it quickly. They're by themselves. They're just knocking it out. Literally the words we use are just knocking it out, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then yeah. you couple those people, if we're talking about a straight dynamic, then you couple those people with people who were taught that it's shameful for, to touch themselves, whose body parts are inside the body, so not even outside. You can't even look at it you, without really trying. You got to really try mm -hmm. for it, which I highly recommend. Get that mirror out. Take a look. It's beautiful and fascinating and super fun and super hot. <laughs> um, but, you know, you have this whole other side of the coin if we're talking about two people in a hetero dynamic um you have the other people who haven't really touched themselves who don't get turned on as quickly or as easily their body does not respond in the same way and they don't have pleasure from the uh the the sheath and the sword so the penis yeah. in in the vagina um they don't they don't experience pleasure that way so it is such an extraordinary mismatch between these two people who are now coming together and because tv has told us that you're going to make out and then you're going to put it in you're going to get it out and everything is good Again, you're going to knock it out, right? That yeah. kind of language. It is no wonder why we are so mismatched, why we are so misaligned, why we are so filled with shame, why we are filled with guilt, while we are filled with I'm broken and all of these damaging messages. But it all comes down to not having accurate sex education and the space to really explore your body and understand how different bodies work and what your body actually responds to and actually needs and having yeah. the tools to communicate that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think for me, I've just noticed it's like, it's two things, right? Because I've got young children, mm. um, that it's education for me. Yeah. And then, then it's the education that I'll be passing on to them and they will also have. So it doesn't fit in a nice neat box of a formal education. Mm -hmm. It's a complete, it's a complete thing. There's the culture, there's the family, there's, and then there's the, the, the more formal stuff. But, um, yeah, it's, it's going to take a while to, to unpack. Um, well, that sounds like you're doing a, doing a great job, um, <laughs> of, of at least, you know, championing the cause anyway. Um, We're all out here trying to do it in all of our different ways. And it's so yeah. important that all of these different shows and books and programs and courses, and it's so important that all of these things exist in the world and that we have so many different voices that are delivering these messages because mm. 
two or three or five people can see, teach the same exact class and different people are going to receive that information differently. So you are doing a great job here by having these conversations and yeah. we, we learn from all different sources. It's not just one thing. And that's not just for sex. That's everything in life. We are not, you know, even take math. Like you're learning math in so many different ways. We think we learn math in a classroom. Sure. You might learn some basics. You learn yeah. some foundation, but then think about all the different ways that math shows up in your life and all the different ways that you have learned to navigate numbers in different contexts. Yeah. Why are we looking at sex education any differently? We are learning yeah. in all different contexts from all different sources at all times. Amazing. Well, great pitch for the sexy directory, I would say. Yeah. You wanna unpack this is the new, the new project. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it is a new project. Um, so I'm going to be launching sometime in 2025. I'm not putting a date on it yet because it's going to take a while. Um, but basically what we are doing with the sexy directory is creating a library of gamified classes. So Ooh. it's really boring to sit and watch a 30, 60, 90 minute class or a four hour class. Uh, I don't think I'll ever have four hour classes, but it's very boring. I have ADHD. I love this stuff. And in all of my self-paced classes, it is impossible for me to get through some of them sometimes, even though I'm so, so, so into it. Um, so what I'm doing with the sexy directory is bringing experts from all different corners of the sex education world from kink to, uh, emotional intelligence, to female orgasms, to, um, erectile dysfunctions, like just all of those things, which is not a dysfunction, by the way, it's just your body being <laughs> just totally <happens>. normal, <laughs> being totally normal. Um, but my goal is to bring a whole bunch of different experts into one place to take the overwhelm out of finding resources. Just mm. come to the sexy directory. Let's find you what you need. And the, the courses are all gamified. So they're all broken up. You're earning points. You're having exercises. It's interactive. So it keeps people engaged. It is, I think a way better way to learn. And especially if we want to help our dudes out there, like, who doesn't love to be a winner? Who doesn't love, like, we don't, we, we want goals when we're learning about sex, but not when we're having sex. So let's build in the goals. Let's build in the games. Let's make learning about sex fun, private, and accessible. Because something that I also find with men specifically is that they don't want to be in a group class. They don't want to be in that community. They don't want to be on a, a live workshop. And then they're probably not going to watch it later either because that's hard and that's boring, right? So I'm trying to take all of the hard pieces out of this and create a one-stop easy way for people to get sex education in a way that's going to make it way more fun than it ever has been before so that you can get the information you need, make sure you understand it and then go have fun with it and then Absolutely. actually use it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. So a real broad spectrum, anything that people might be curious about or anything that they think they want to know more about or maybe missing out on. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And by working with different experts within the field, it's not all on me. I, I used to like, initially I wanted to do this myself and like, I honestly don't like putting classes together. I just yeah. don't. I love doing this. I'm a producer. I love pulling things together. I love helping other people. And so it just kind of clicked with me that I was like, wait, I don't have to teach everything. I'm not an expert in everything. Yeah. What I am an expert in is pulling shit together. Yeah. So let me do that. Let me lean into my own area of expertise so that I can build this platform, not only for the people who are needing to learn more and wanting to learn more and not knowing who to go to, but also for all of the incredible, incredible, incredible experts and leaders that are already in the field. Let yeah. me put them into one place so that the person who doesn't follow them all on Instagram, who doesn't necessarily listen to these podcasts, but maybe just stumbled upon a video somewhere, maybe they stumbled upon me on a podcast or something like that. And now they have a pathway to find all of these incredible people. And if they want to go do more work with them, great. This yeah. is your entryway. You don't have to rely on social media that, that shadow bans us and kicks yeah. us off their platforms. And yes, it's going to be a tricky thing because I am going to have to lean on those platforms to kind of get the word out. That's, that's marketing challenge. But yeah. 
at the end of the day, I want to make it easy for people to find the educators that they want to learn with and get the information that they need to have and do it in a way that they're actually going to retain that information. Yeah. So that's, that's wow. what we're doing with the sexy directory. Awesome. Um, hey, let's, where can people find you? You've got so much going on. Where can people I find know. you? So the um, podcast, birds and bees don't fuck. Sexy directory. There's a URL that's coming out 2025. Well, the best thing is honestly like get on, get on my mailing list. When I'm, when I have something to share, I share it. I don't uh, yeah. do a weekly anything. Um, I took a pause from birds and bees, but there are a lot of episodes for you to listen to. Um, awesome. So yeah, I mean, if my website is probably the fast, the easiest thing to get you to everything, cause there's links for everything there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's just arielzadok.com. It's a R I E L L E Z A D O K.com. Got you. Awesome. Good stuff. Well, let's wrap this up. Well, Great. yeah. Thanks heaps. So thank you for having me on. <laughs> this has been so delightful. I love these conversations. I love that you're having them. Um, it is so, so, so important that we are in all of the spaces, no pun intended, having these conversations. So thank you for bringing me into your world and introducing no me to your audience here. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, yeah, we'll say hello to New Zealand for you. Or you, yes, can, you can do it now. Um, yeah. <laughs> Kia ora. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Before we sign off, we wanted to ask you again for your help. Because we talk about sex, we keep getting shut up across a lot of social media platforms. And this not only makes it hard for us to be found, but it says that sex is not okay to talk about. Not only is sex okay to talk about, it is totally essential because more knowledge means better outcomes across a whole bunch of measures for all of us. You can make a difference. And the thing we need you to do is your active support. So please follow the podcast and sign up to our socials, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, wherever you like. You can find us over at sexinspace.com and click on our social links from there. Help us make sex an okay space. Thanks for taking this trip with us. Until the next time, see you on the next episode.